Okay, let's talk about 121 through 133. On 121, if we're given this function, what is its lead coefficient and its constant? Well, that is the lead coefficient. The lead coefficient is 3. And its constant, the constant is the number at the end that does not have a variable with it. Okay, so that's the constant. So the constant is negative 1. Let's talk about these a little bit more. So if I had uh, 5x to the third plus 3x squared minus 2x minus 10, okay, the lead coefficient is the one in front, as long as you've written it in order from the biggest degree to the smallest degree. Okay, and this one has a degree 3, and this one has degree 2, degree 1, and this is called degree 0. And it's the degree 0 one is also known as the constant. All right, and that means this is the lead coefficient. This is an, also a coefficient, it's just not the lead one. Okay, but that's also a coefficient. That's also a coefficient. That's called a constant. And remember to include the sign in front of it too, All right? So this one, the lead coefficient would be five in this problem, and the constant on this problem would be negative 10. All right, moving on. True or false, you can use a regression equation as a line of best fit. Yes, if you do a linear regression, it's going to act like a line of best fit. So if you have data and you graphed it, it would kind of look like this. If you have an equation for it, it's really handy. And to get the equation of the line that runs through there, you can do what's called linear regression. Uh, it's not in the scope of this video right now to show you that whole process, but, but basically under a graphing calculator and a TI, it would be under stat, and you'd have to enter your data under the list one and list two, and then you'd go under stat and calculate linear regression, and it would tell you your numbers that you'd use for your slope and your y-intercept. And that's a line of best fit, and it is the same as a, a regression equation. Those are kind of an interchangeable uh, couple of terms. All right. Moving on, a radian is a measure of degrees, which is about 180 divided by what? Well, a radian is a, uh, here's, a here's a picture of kind of what a radian is. A radian is a number of degrees, okay? And that number of degrees, if I were to uh, have a circle here and have this be a radian of degrees. I'm not telling you how many degrees it is yet, but if that's a radian right there, then this distance right here is the same as this distance right here, which is the same as this distance right here, of course, because they're both radiuses. Okay, but that arc length right here, this would be the same. So a radian is going to make it so that all the, the two red lines and the green line are all the same length, okay? And that's going to be a radian. Well, if you look at that and you just kind of think it through, and you know this is related to circles, it won't take you too long to figure out it probably that there might be a pi involved somehow. So I'm going to skip, you the long, skip through the long explanation here and just say that it's 180 divided by pi. Moving on. A recursive sequence is as follows. U sub 0 equals 20. U sub n is equal to U sub n minus 1 times 3. What is U sub 1 equal to? All right. This is almost like a foreign language. But if you start a recursive sequence by saying U sub 0 equals 20, that means your first term in your sequence of numbers is 20. It's 20 and then something and then something and then something. So basically you have uh, a list of terms and 20 is your first one. When they say this, they're saying that u sub n is given by u sub n minus 1. That means that any random term, like this is u sub 0, and this is u sub 1, and this is u sub 2. But like way out on the list somewhere, you got all these numbers in a row. Way out on the list somewhere, you might have a random one we call u sub. And if we don't know which one it is, we can call it u sub n. Then the term right in front of it would be u sub n minus 1. And the term right after it would be u sub n plus 1. All right, so this term, I don't know, let's say it's 260 or whatever it is. That term is u sub n. The one in front of it is u sub n minus 1. So what they're trying to say in this is that if 
u sub n is a randomly chosen term, then u sub n minus 1 will be the one right in front of it. So in front of it on the list, like right before it. So if I have the number right before it and I times it by 3, I will get u sub n. That means is every number that's on the list comes from the number in front of it times 20. Okay, so that means that it would go 20, sorry, times 3, I said 20. I start with 20, and I times by 3 to get the next number, 60, and I times by 3 to get the next number after that, 60 times 3, 180, and I times 3 to get the number after that. Get the idea? All right, so what is u sub 1 equal to? Well, if u sub 0 is my first term, u sub 1 is my next term. And that's right here, and there it is. It's 60, because it's three times this term that was right in front of it. Okay, so the answer would be 60. Moving on. Given a function, f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 1. Compute the discriminant, and then tell, tell, then tell how many solutions f of x will have. All right, the discriminant is part of the whole quadratic formula thing x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. The discriminant is this part right here. And the way it can tell us how many solutions you're going to have is that in this formula, you've got a plus and a minus going here. And that means you're usually going to have two answers. You're going to do the problem once with plus, and then you're going to do the problem again with minus, and you'll have two different answers. But the only way you could have no answers at all is if this underneath the root was a negative. Because if you have a negative underneath the square root, that makes the whole thing imaginary. All right, so this is the discriminant right here, b squared minus 4ac. And we calculate that, and when we look at b squared minus 4ac, if it is negative or less than 0, then there's no solutions. Because, remember, if it's negative, then you've got a negative under the square root. If b squared minus 4ac is positive, if it's bigger than 0, then you will have two solutions. Because it'll be a positive number, and you'll have to add it once, and then subtract it once to get the two different answers. So there'll be two solutions. If b squared minus 4ac, it can only be one other thing. It's either greater than 0, less than 0, or it's equal to 0. If it's equal to 0, then that's the only time you'd have only one solution. Because if it's equal to 0 underneath the square root, then adding it or subtracting it would be the exact same thing. You'd get the same answer. So it makes it only one solution. All right, so in this case... What's our b squared minus 4ac? Well, this is a, and this is b. Notice it's a negative 2, and this is c. It's negative 1. All right, now I'm going to put in b squared minus 4ac, and I'm going to replace these with empty parentheses. Okay, b squared would be negative 2 squared minus 4 times a is 1, and c is negative 1. All right, so that would be 4 minus 4 times 1 times negative 1 makes negative 4, or minus negative 4. That means 4 plus 4, which would be 8. So we were going to get 8 underneath our square root if we ever did this problem. What does that tell me? Well, it's a positive number, and therefore I'm going to have two solutions. All right? So you do your b squared minus 4ac, you find out the answer. If the answer is positive like this one was, then you'll have two solutions to your quadratic. If it's negative, then you're not going to have any solutions because you'll have a negative under the square root. And if it's equal to 0, if you do b squared minus 4ac and it comes up to 0, then you will only have one solution. And by the way, that one solution will be the vertex. All right, that's because if you think of it as a, a quadratic that's going to touch only one time, then it's the vertex of the parabola. Get that? All right, moving on. 126, domain is like the inputs, range is like the outputs. True or false? 
I just wanted to remind you on this one that domain and inputs do go together. And that's, it's a true statement. And range goes with outputs. And domain also goes with x, and range also goes with y. All right. On to the next topic. Inverse of 4 versus reciprocal of 4. It's easy to get these confused. The inverse of 4 is negative 4. The reciprocal of 4 is 1 over 4. Inverses, like this and this are inverses, they will add up to 0. Whereas reciprocals, like this and this are reciprocals, they will multiply and equal 1. All right, so you got to keep those straight. So if I was asking about the number uh, uh, two thirds, and I wanted the inverse, the inverse of two thirds would be negative two thirds. And if I wanted the reciprocal of two thirds, it would be the reciprocal is you put one over it, which in a fractions case means you're going to flip it. So the reciprocal of two thirds would be three over two. Okay, so there's another example on that. Number 29, what does sum mean? This is just so important because you're going through a really hard problem and all of a sudden they throw in the word sum and if you don't know what it means, the whole really hard problem, you'll never be able to figure it out, all based on this one little thing. So sum means add. Difference means subtract. And some people get picky about uh, how sum means the answer to an addition problem. And difference means the answer to a subtraction problem. So if you need it that specific, there you go. On to the next one, product. Product means the answer to a multiplication question. Or basically, if you hear product, you think at times. And quotient means divide, or the answer to a division problem. All right, the factors of six. Factors means two numbers you can multiply and make six. Well, there's a couple combos that work. One times six make six, and two times three makes six. So these are all factors then. That's a factor, that's a factor, factor, factor. So those are four factors of six. So if you have to list all the factors, some numbers like 24 are a real pain because there's a lot of things you can multiply to make a 24. One more note on this is that we're not going to use fractions because if we get into fractions, you know, it would be like one half of 12. Uh, those are sort of like factors, but we're only looking for uh, integers when we do factors of six, and specifically whole numbers, which would make it positive, because uh, we don't want to get into the negatives either, because negative three times negative two would also be six. So usually when they just ask for factors, they're just talking about the positive ones. All right, and that's all we have for you on this one.